Thank you so much, my friends, for taking time to click on this video. And I just want to thank you as well for subscribing, for liking, for sharing, and for joining Melvi Broadcasting Network as we spread the everlasting gospel to the ends of the world. I also just want to thank you for the blessing of resources that God has given you, which you have shared with us. As I've always said, and I want to say again, Melvis' work continues to grow in leaps and bounds, and our gospel footprint has gone around the world. It is for that reason, my friends, that we need more resources to keep this ministry growing and impacting more people, and changing lives along the way. I don't want to spend a lot of your time, but I want to come back at the end of this video to share with you a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that I'm hoping you can join us to bring it to pass because God is calling you and us to do something that will impact this world forever. So in the meantime, I just want you to relax, whisper a prayer to God, and enjoy this video. I'll see you on the end of this video. Stay tuned and God bless. Um, let's get right into God's word. Um, we're going to go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, Proverbs chapter 23, verses 1 through 3, which says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Our message this Sabbath is entitled, Poisoning the Remnant. Poisoning the Remnant. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study a word, to go through these uh, lessons around health that we'll talk about today. Right now, Lord, I ask that you make me just a nail on the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. And upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let me not be seen or heard, Lord. Instead, we want to hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go to the book of Daniel, and I will go through the story quickly. You all know the story, and I won't get into it from a deep uh, biblical analysis. But just to set the stage for some of the other things that we are going to talk about, in Daniel chapter 1, um, Nebuchadnezzar has now um, completed his first raid of Jerusalem and taken with him some of the young nobles and princes, including Daniel um, and the three Hebrew boys. This was in the third year of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came into Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God when he carried it into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. I, I won't get too deep into this, but Nebuchadnezzar's approach to world domination was that he would take of the next generation of leaders, train them to be Chaldeans, Chaldeans, Babylonians, uh, and once he did that, he could send them back to rule their own country uh, as they served him. This was his goal, at least in part, or his plan here. He wanted them to learn to speak the language of the Babylonians, uh, and as we'll see, to eat the food and learn the customs of the Babylonians. In verse 5, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. So this is the actual food from uh, off the quote-unquote king's table, so nourishing them for three years. And at the end thereof, they might stand before the king. Now, I would imagine that as this was going on, Daniel and the three Hebrew boys were quite stressed out. We'll talk more about stress, and I won't get too deep into it here. 
But what stress does is stress causes our body to go into a, a serious reaction. The key mediator of this is a hormone called cortisol. And of course, along with this comes adrenaline and the fight or flight response that we've all learned about. But what happens inside the body is that this cortisol, as it acts on fat tissue, uh, causes um, the fat cells to begin to break down and release free fatty acids. This causes you to become resistant to insulin. And if that term sounds familiar, it's because insulin res resistance is the hallmark of diabetes. But it doesn't just do that. It goes into the muscle cells. It causes the protein in the muscles to get broken down, decreases um, insulin signaling, so there's less receptors to, a, to get the insulin to bring energy into the muscles, and so you get even further insulin resistance. But here's the kicker. In the liver, it does two things. This diagram only shows one. It causes the liver to make sugar for energy, while at the same time, um, as it does this, it can actually cause more free fatty acids to be released. So stress is literally the platform upon which diseases like diabetes, and one that you've also probably heard about, metabolic syndrome, rests. This is why it is not enough to have a good diet. You must also have that eighth um, law of health. You must have trust in God. Because if you don't trust God, and you're always uh, anxious and stressed, you'll still get sick. In fact, what we say here is that stressed, spelled backwards, is desserts. Not only will you get sick, but all of a sudden the foods that seem to make you feel better, foods we now call comfort foods, um, will be, you'll have less ability to, to avoid them because they will actually feel better in the reward pathways of your brain if you are stressed out because it'll feel like you're getting the cheap calorie energy that you're in desperate need of at the time. This is why Solomon warned, and I am sure Daniel and the three Hebrew boys were aware, this is why Solomon warned in Proverbs 23, one through three, that when you sit with a ruler like Nebuchadnezzar, consider diligently what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to appetite. Do not be desirous of his dainties for they are deceitful meat. They'll make you feel better, think you're better, when actually you're worse off. And the question is, does the king of Babylon do this today? If we are living in the last days and we talk about uh, spiritual Babylon, well, here's a, here's a billboard from McDonald's. It says, crafted for your craving. There's a desire to control your appetite for profit. But in order to do this, as we're talking about, the food that the Babylonian king of our day had to prepare has to be designed for you to get addicted. It has to be crafted for your craving. Well, what else did the king of Babylon do? Well, he, since the 1950s till now, he's massively increased the portion size, serving size. A hamburger in 1950 was only 3.9 ounces. It's 12 ounces now. A soda was 7 ounces. Soda's 42 ounces now, and sometimes even bigger. And you can see french fries went from 2.4 to 6. 0.7 ounces. So one thing is there's a lot more food being served and consumed. But the delicacies are based on the triad, this evil triad of salt, sugar, and fat. And I won't have time to get deep into all of these this morning, but I want you to get that it is the way that these foods are designed and put together that causes the addictive nature of the standard American diet, one that is being exported around the world. I see it in Jamaica. I've seen it in Africa. I've seen it in Asia. These foods are being shipped all over the globe. And the SAD, the standard American diet, the SAD is now causing the diseases of America and the West to be found in other parts of the world. Why? Because as the New York Times says, there is ex they comment here in this uh, article, the extraordinary science of addictive junk food. Isn't that powerful? The extraordinary science of addictive junk food. How do they do this? Well, they study what is called the bliss point. They find out exactly where the right amount of salt is what this graph is, or sugar, or whatever it is, so that you get the, the most pleasure at that point. And that's how they design the food. And there's, it gets fancy. They can look at how the brain functions. They can do some pretty impressive things. But what they begin to do is even make food that has what they call vanishing caloric density, like Cheetos and hot Cheetos and Takis and 
stuff like that. You know, the food that crunches when you, you stuff like Cheetos, you bite it and it crunches, or cheese doodles, you bite it and it crunches, and then it melts in your mouth. It becomes like a paste. So when it hits your stomach, your brain is saying, I heard a crunch like a cucumber or an apple, but where's all the nutrients? Where's all the, the fiber? Where's all, all right, we got to eat more. We got to eat more. Vanishing caloric density. The food is designed to be weapons of mass destruction. Here, the, 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 um, the tobacco industry got in trouble because the tobacco industry said, um, you know, our product is not addictive. It doesn't cause disease. And they busted them when they found all the secret uh, papers that showed that it did. But the food industry, much of which has been bought out over time or merged or, or, or ming mingled in with the food industry, uh, with the tobacco industry, the food industry never hid the truth. They said, bet you can't eat just one. They said, once you pop, you can't stop. The food companies explored our biological preferences, uh, uh, the reward pathway in the brain, under the guidance of a neurotransmitter called dopamine, which is the pleasure uh, hormone in our brain, which is why cocaine makes people high. It is released with food and can be manipulated to make some foods give you more pleasure than others. New York Times, again, um, in this one, um, overconsumption of fast food triggers addiction-like neuroaddictive responses in the brain, making it harder to trigger the release um, of dopamine. So they push so that you have to eat more and more and more and more to get the pleasure out of the food, um, and it is, it is very powerful. But how do they do this? Well, how do they get you there? Well, if you look at this, the food industry spends about $2 billion a year marketing to children. The fast food industry spends more than $5 million every day marketing unhealthy food to children. And nearly all, 98% of food advertisement viewed by children are for products that are high in fat, uh, sugar, or sodium. Most of it, 79%, is low in fiber. One study found that when children were exposed to television content with food advertising, they consumed 45% more food than children exposed to content with non-food advertising. This is the power of the television. I can't get into that now. It moves you from one brainwave, um, uh, uh, um, uh, which gives you more attentiveness and focus, to lower brainwaves, um, where you're more likely to just receive the information when, as you're in like a kind of a napping, daydreaming kind of state when you watch television. And so the kids would eat more if they were given more commercials like this. But here's where it gets interesting. Each day, African-American children see twice as many calories advertised in fast food commercials as white children. You say, well, how is that possible? Well, there's two ways. One, studies have said for a long time African-American children watch more television, so you're going to get more exposure. But also, the programs that African-American children watch are also targeted with more fast food, junk food commercials. Joel Furman, uh, based out of um, uh, New Jersey, a physician, Joel Furman, MD. Dr. Furman is... Um, uh, a plant-based physician who's been around a long time giving talks, lectures, and he has lines of products and stuff. But he says this in his book, Eat to Live. It's one of the best statements I've ever read on the way that the king of Babylon has taken captive the world when it comes to um, food from, the, from these food industries. It says the modern food and drug industry has converted a significant portion of the world's people to a new religion a massive cult of pleasure seekers who consume coffee, cigarettes, soft drinks, candy, chocolate, alcohol, processed foods, fast foods, and concentrated dairy fat, cheese, in a self-indulgent orgy of destructive behavior. When the inevitable results of such bad habits appear, pain, suffering, sickness, and disease, the addicted cult members drag themselves to physicians and demand drugs to alleviate their pain mask their symptoms, and cure their diseases. These revelers become so drunk on their addictive behavior and the accompanying addictive thinking that they can no longer tell the difference between health and health care. In America, we've been crying for health care reform. And nobody's really asked, how do we get America healthy? So from when they were children, um, they, you know, Ronald Reagan was the one who made ketchup a vegetable. And you can see from the school lunch programs, historically, the food has been 
very devoid of nutrients, um, very high in fat and salt and sugar. Um, you think of pizza, pizza is, in many things I've read, pizza is the most addictive food you can eat. And, if you th and what is in it? Well, the dough is basically white flour, which turns into sugar. Um, there's tons of cheese, right? And cheese is full of fat and salt. And then, of course, you throw the meat on top. Um, and the sauce is also sometimes has a ton of sugar in it. And it's, so it's, it's, a, it's a medley of all these things. And this is what children are fed. So children are trained. Just like they were trying to train, train Daniel and the three Hebrew boys to be Babylonians, we, from a childhood we're trained to eat mac and cheese and, and pizzas and things like this that have very little nutrient value but are very um, almost habit-forming in that you can crave the foods. An example of this is government cheese. This is President Ronald Reagan holding it up after they figured out a way to take the waste products from milk production, the fat that was left over that they couldn't use, probably from processes like skimming of the milk, and make it into blocks of cheese that they then turned around and took taxpayer dollars, paid the farmers for this, what would have been thrown away, like waste food, um, and, and turn it into blocks that then the taxpayer funded to give these blocks of cheese to poor people in white rural America, in black and brown inner cities, on Indian reservations, uh, all over the world. Even when I was in Guam, people in Guam said they used to get it as well. Cheese is one of the most uh, um, unhealthy foods we can actually eat. Cheese is so addictive, one doctor calls it dairy crack. And this is from Neil Bernard's book, The Cheese Trap. Uh, this is a, uh, I should say it's an article on the book, The Cheese Trap, um, which I recommend. It really points out that cheese even has in it a substance, case of morphones, that are related to like heroin and, and, and morphine. It's very low, but there's, the, there's some opiate effect that actually can stimulate the brain. And it's one of the reasons why people tell you it's easier to give up meat than to give up cheese, that a lot of people say. But it's, cheese can be very difficult for a lot of people to give up because it has a lot of properties, everything from the salt and the fat to these case of morphones that actually work to keep you trapped. And of course, if you're eating a block of cholesterol, salt, and saturated fat, it's definitely not going to be good for your heart. When I was growing up, a lot of Adventists wouldn't eat meat, but they ate cheese on everything. And I remember one pastor that I love very dearly when we, we would go to Burger King, and I wasn't vegetarian at the time, and I'd get a Whopper or whatever, he would order, they didn't have veggie Whoppers back then, he'd order a Whopper with extra cheese, with no meat, with no beef patty. And later on, he actually got pretty sick, and actually, ultimately, it was a heart attack that he died of. So cheese all by itself is a bad food. It may be one of the most unhealthy things you can eat. If this was put on the table before Daniel, Daniel would have said, nope, I'm not eating that stuff. And we, in these last days, we need clarity of mind, have to think like that. So there are fats that we should avoid. I won't say that, but this is what the Bible says about fat. Leviticus 7, 23 and 25, it says, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, You shall eat no fat of ox or sheep or goat. Verse 25, For every person who eats of the fat of an animal, of which a food offering may be made to the Lord, shall be cut off from his people. So you're not supposed to eat the fat of the animal. Because the fat, as, we, uh, you know, as, as you start to look at it, it's the fat, it's the saturated fat. When it gets down deep in our gut, that actually damages the gut microbiome and allows toxins to cross the gut barrier and go, enter the bloodstream. And then those toxins can cross the blood-brain barrier and actually uh, cause inflammation in the brain, as we're going to talk about in a second, and actually cause things like brain fog and may even contribute to the development of dementia directly through the toxins, but also... Because they clog arteries, a lot of people wind up with what we call multi-infarct dementia. Little tiny strokes in the brain over years that ultimately coalesce to cause dementia and loss of cognitive function. Our brains, our minds must be protected. Some people say, well, I'll eat fish. Um, some fish has more cholesterol than pork. Some fishes do, some types of fish. Um, but there's a lot of mercury in the fish if you get it from the ocean. Um, you can get your omega-3 fatty acids. People say, I need omega-3s. You can get them from elsewhere. Um, but they're often very polluted, not just uh, mercury, but PCBs, for example, as the, as the poisons bioaccumulate when you eat seafood, right? So the little tiny fish eats a little tiny piece of mercury. The bigger fishes eat all of those little fish. But So that bigger fish gets a lot of the mercury. And then the fish that eats that fish gets even more. And up the chain it goes until we eat the fish. Um, 
And what we now know um, is that they've actually classified um, as group one carcinogens uh, processed meats like salami, um, which includes bacon, sausages, hot dogs. I was just reading something that said if you, if you, every time you eat a hot dog, you take like 36 minutes off your life. Wow. And so they've classified these things as class one carcinogens. And this speaks, that speaks to their ability to, to cause cancer. But it doesn't speak to their ability to cause heart disease and strokes and other problems like that. Of course, in the next group, the group 2A, and, and, and let me say this, group 1 uh, uh, carcinogens um, are the same as like the, the, the cancer-causing effect of cigarettes. But group 2A says, it says they, they probably cause cancer, and in that group is pork, beef, and lamb. Talking about the table of Babylon, many of us grew up eating lots and lots of eggs. And what we found is, we're finding through the studies that it, it, eggs increase the risk of cardiovascular disease by 19%, colon cancer by nearly five times. And you're hearing more and more young people are having serious problems with colon cancer. One of the most famous was Chadwick, Chadwick Boseman. Um, and I don't know how he ate, so I'm not speaking to, to his situation. But I know when I used to go to the gym, there were a lot of young men who used to just down raw eggs to try and get protein to get super strong, um, or they you know, eat boiled eggs and stuff like that. But it actually increased the risk of cancer. Diabetes, we talked about, oh, we'll talk a little bit about how fat causes, helps cause diabetes. And lethal prostate cancer by 81%. And black men in, in specific are most likely to have really serious prostate uh, cancer problems. Uh, Jamaican men also are very high up and probably for, you know, related to uh, the African-American um, risks, um, why this happens. But one of the things that we know is that um, prostate cancer is increased, and not just prostate cancer, but deadly prostate cancer is increased with the consumption of eggs. And so we also know that when you eat fat, one of the things that it does is it actually increases the appetite. So when you eat Kentucky Fried Chicken and it's all greasy and slimy and fatty, it actually increases the appetite. So rather than turning down your appetite, it increases it. Um, and it does something else. We want, people often will ask about um, um, uh, diabetes and how people get diabetes. We think it's from eating sugar. Sugar is a strong contributor, but not for the reason we think. Fat is what does it. When fat jams up this lock and key, this is where the insulin receptor is. Insulin plugs in on this is the cell here. Insulin plugs in, and this receptor, is jam if it's jammed up with fat, insulin can't do its job. Its job is to go in here, turn this lock, and this gate, this glucose channel opens, and the sugar goes into the cell. If this is a muscle cell, the muscle will then burn the sugar as energy or store it as glycogen, and you are in good shape. But if it, this is clogged up because of fat, then the sugar stays out here, and you have high blood sugar, high glucose, blood glucose level. And that's how diabetes happens. But it's not just eating fat. I'll just throw this in there. Sugar does it too. Because when you eat sugar, it goes, uh, uh, the, the table sugar, sucrose, which is named a million different things and hidden in food, names like fructose and high fructose, corn syrup, and other things like that. Um, when, it gets in, when it gets in, even honey and some of the things people think are healthy, when it gets in there, it gets into your liver. Your liver, actually, in the way it, it biochemically processes the sugar, it actually releases fatty acids itself and causes insulin resistance. So sugar, now, so here's the kicker, the American diet combines sugar with fat, right? That's what a donut basically is, sugar and fat. And I could go on and on with all the foods that are like that. French fries are basically sugar and fat. You take a white potato and deep fry it. So this is why diabetes is such a scourge. Because a lot of people don't know you gotta cut the processed sugars out, you gotta cut out the fats, even the oils, which maybe we talk about that this afternoon. So what happens? Well, insulin resistance, once you get insulin resistance, it messes with your appetite and it causes something called leptin resistance. And once you're leptin, your fat cells make leptin to tell your body that you're full, that your fat cells have enough. Once that is broken, you don't, your appetite no longer works and you'll just keep eating. And the problem that happens when you, especially when you keep eating all these fats, is that fatty acid mediated hypothalamic inflammation is real. And this is one article that I read on it. And what it basically is telling us is that these saturated fats, as I said earlier, cause this, these toxins that enter the brain and inflame the brain, and the brain then no longer works right. And so inflamed, inflammation linked with Alzheimer's and reduced cognition and something we now call brain fog. It also um, 
Long for Alzheimer's sufferers, brain inflammation ignites a neuron killing forest fire. And what we now know is that it is inflammation that is our enemy. And even in this COVID pandemic, it's inflammation through a cytokine storm that the virus causes. But if you're already in a state where you're already inflamed because you're eating processed foods, junk foods, fast foods, meat, dairy, sugars, oils, and your body's already inflamed and you get COVID, now you go into a hyper-inflammatory state. That's one of the reasons why in America uh, COVID is doing the number that it's doing is because we all live stressed, which causes inflammation, and we all uh, most of us, many of us at least, eat a high inflammatory causing diet. But it's not just that. The other thing that does it is marijuana. So while marijuana is legal in New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and everyone is saying how harmless it is, this study, out of, um, I think this was done at um, one of the hospitals in Greece, long-term users of marijuana gradually become worse at learning and remembering things a new study suggests. And if you've been around people who smoke marijuana for a long time, this probably is not a very big surprise. But there are also some other foods that can cause brain fog. I just want to bring this in there, too, because we're talking about the poisoning of the remnant. If, if being a Christian in the last days is about having critical thinking skills and being able to think clearly, we are warned to be sober and to be vigilant. That's the warning that comes to us. We know that it is the frontal lobe, and we'll talk about that this afternoon more. It is the frontal lobe of the brain where salvation and the thinking and the choice to choose Christ. This is the, like the most holy. If your body is a temple, your frontal lobe is the most holy place. So the devil wants to get at your frontal lobe. And so all that we're talking about, as, hel- as important as it be healthy and have longevity, what is most important is spiritual clarity. And here, this is what Daniel and the three Hebrew boys gained. This, it's not a, to me, it's not a, a, um, a coincidence that Daniel decides to eat right, and he is the one given all of these amazing uh, prophecies in the book of Daniel and, his, and the ability to um, understand prophecies and dreams. But MSG and salad dressings and pre-cooked meals, the, 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 um, the free glutamic acid, which is the G in the MSG, becomes glutamate. Glutamate is a neurotransmitter, um, and when you get too much glutamate, um, uh, you, it depletes glutathione and other antioxidants. And so it changes the way the bl- brain works. And if the brain does not have the ability to scavenge and get rid of uh, free radicals, which is what happens, then there is constant damage in the brain. So you eat MSG, something used to preserve food, and that can happen. Artificial sweeteners like aspartame um, that break down into products like aspartic acid, phenylalanine, and methanol. These all excite the brain cells and then kill them. Methanol itself becomes uh, formaldehydes, which is a toxin and poison that we use to actually preserve dead bodies. So what we eat does matter um, on a lot of different levels. Daniel 1 and verse 6, now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, and it tells you all of their new names. The Bible says in verse 8, but Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He said, listen, you're not going to poison me. We are not to be defiled. If our body is the temple, then literally our digestive system is like that brazen laver at the beginning of the sanctuary, the largest piece of furniture, and no unclean thing could be put on it. So nothing that would destroy us should come in us. Why? Because food that fogs the brain has spiritual consequences. It has spiritual consequences. Isaiah 1 and verse 18 says, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you can't reason, if you can't think straight, if you're intoxicated, you can miss out on salvation. Obviously, I didn't talk about alcohol. But clearly, alcohol, alcohol, one, increases appetite. I have a slide on that that I skipped. But it also inflames the brain and causes cognitive decline. And once you start to step back and look at what the impact is on a lifestyle where you're in front of the screens, on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer, on your TV, all the time messing with your brain, and then um, not exercising like we used to, not being out in the air like we used to. And then you look at what we're eating, it's food-like substances. It's not even real food anymore. It doesn't come from the ground, it comes from a factory. 
and all of the impact that this has on how we function, it is no, uh, no um, surprise that so many are going to be deceived in the last days. Satan is programming their minds to turn off. He wants to poison the remnant. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. The prince of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your meat and drink. Why should I see your faces worse like th than all the other children of your sort? In other words, all the rest of the guys who came from Israel or from all the other captured lands. Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. If I mess up and you guys look terrible, he's going to kill me. Daniel said to Melzar, And I'll skip to the next verse here. Prove your servants, I beseech thee, 10 days. And let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them 10 days. So basically Daniel sets up a scientific study let us be given this food, and you can give everybody else the rest. And then at the end, evaluate who looks different. And at the end of the 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter, healthier in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Then Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine which they should drink. And he gave them pulse. And the word for pulse actually can translate to the word like to, to lentils. And look at what lentils are good for. They help control diabetes, manage weight. Sprouted lentils aid the muscle and generation of uh, uh, muscle generation in the body, right? That's interesting. Not, not raw eggs, but sprouted lentils would be better to eat. Helps optimal brain functioning. There's a lot more I could say here, full of um, vitamins, minerals, helps to fight cancer, but it definitely helps you think better. Clears the mind. Blueberries enhance brain flow. Here's a great one. So if you want a, your mind to work better, if your children are in school, blueberries actually help improve memory in older adults. So if you eat blueberries, which are rich in antioxidants, they can actually help to correct things that are wrong in the brain. And blueberries may boost brain function for kids. Look at this study. And what they found is that when you give the kids blueberries, and I've talked about this before in some of my other talks, uh, zero cups, one cups, two cups, the kids who got two cups of blueberries equivalent before going to school perform better. Diet impacts us that directly. The studies are beginning to show it. And if diet can affect how you think and how you learn, it can clearly and definitely affect salvation for you because you've got to be able to choose. It may not be salvific in and of itself, but not having a clear mind or, or if you intentionally are destroying yourself with, with a poor diet, then, then you have a problem. Here's what Ellen White says. She says, through the, fidelity to the, through the fidelity to the principles of temperance shown by the Hebrew youth, God is speaking to the youth of today. There is need of men who, like Daniel, will do and dare for the cause of right. Pure hearts, strong hands, fearless courage are needed. For the warfare between vice and virtue calls for ceaseless vigilance. To every soul, Satan comes with temptation in many alluring forms on the point of indulgence of appetite. The body is a most important medium through which the mind and the soul are developed for the upbuilding of character. Hence, it is the adversary of souls. Uh, hence, it is that the adversary of souls directs his temptations to the enfeebling and degrading of the physical powers. His success here often means the surrender of the whole being to evil. The tendencies of the physical nature, unless under the dominion of a higher power, will surely work ruin and death. In the last days, again, our goal is to develop and have the character of Christ, to gain victory over sin as he works in the sanctuary to cleanse it in heaven. Each of our hearts should be cleansed. The body is to be brought into subjection to the higher powers of being, the passions to be controlled by the will which is itself to be under the control of God. The kingly power of reason, sanctified by divine grace, is to bear sway in the life. Intellectual power, physical stamina, and the length of life depend upon immutable laws. Through obedience to these laws, man may stand conqueror of himself, conqueror of his own inclinations, 
conqueror of principalities and powers, of the rulers of darkness of this world, and of spiritual wickedness in high places, Ephesians 6, 12. If you want to win the victory in spiritual warfare, it's, 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 a, it's critical that we pray, but it is also critical that we eat the kind of food, have the kind of diet, uh, bring our appetites under control so that we can fight the spiritual warfare with the clearest of minds. Daniel 1.17, and as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king uh, had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. The king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers that were in his, all his realm. Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. And this tells you that a few things happened. One, the way that they took a stand on lifestyle and living uh, in diet, exercise, water consumption, all these things, as they, as they agreed with God on these things, they were smarter. They were 10 times better than everyone else. And verse 21 is to tell you that Daniel was granted as well a very long life. He lived through Nebuchadnezzar's reign, through his son's reign, through his grandson's reign, all the way into three kings into the next empire. Ellen White says this, In no other way has Satan come with his temptations to fall in humankind as successfully as through appetite. It is necessary to maintain a living connection with heaven, seeking as often as did Daniel three times a day for divine grace to resist appetite and passion. Wrestling with appetite and passion unaided by divine power will be unsuccessful. But make Christ your stronghold. And the language of your soul will be, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans 8, 37. Said the apostle Paul, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27. And the word castaway there in the Greek is adakemos. It means to be disqualified. Paul says, I do not want to have run this race. I do not want to have done all these things that I'm being, that God has asked me to do. I don't want to have done all of that. And when the final analysis, I am disqualified. Satan wants to poison the remnant. He wants us to, to, to go slack. I've heard pastors mock our health message from the pulpit, laugh about the burgers they eat and, 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 and all the other things. Adventists who, who, who are wine connoisseurs now. But what you watch is as we walk away from the truth on the health message, it isn't long often before we walk away other truths. The world is following what we should have followed. The world is going more whole food, more plant-based. I speak on programs and specials all the time of people who are, who are, who are, who are not Christian at all. Never read the Bible, but they've understood that this way is the best way to eat. And it's a shock that in our own churches, we would rather often eat the food from off of uh, the king of Babylon's table, even though we have the message that says, come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon. And yes, this is a tough subject. We'll talk more about it this afternoon, but it is incredible um, that we are uh, still uh, arguing sometimes over this subject. The scriptures state it, the spirit of prophecy support it, and the science now sees it. Don't let, don't let them poison you. You are among the remnant. Let's do what God says do. Step by step, little by little, let's move in the direction that Christ would have us move in. Is our prayer. 
Let us pray, I should say. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to look at these issues. So many, so deep, Lord, so many things that we're exposed to, to um, that, that are damaging to our bodies in this modern world of profits and of greed, not just the greed of individuals, but corporate greed. But Father God, we have been called like Daniel and the three Hebrew boys to make a stand to the Ashkenazes of the world that we will not eat off the king's table. Help us, Father God, to eat the way you have prescribed for us to do, to live that way, to trust in you. Most importantly, we've got to turn our, over our trust to you. Believe that you can give us victory. As Paul says, Lord, when I am weak, then am I strong. Yes, some of us have weaknesses, but if we lean on you, Jesus, our weaknesses will become strengths. Bless us to this end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. My friend, thank you so much. You've taken your time to watch this video. You've been blessed. You've been wondering how do we get to create such videos and share them to you for free? No, 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 no. They are not for free, my friends. We do spend a lot of time, money, and equipment to generate these videos. And that's why I'm here to invite you, if you've not already done so, to subscribe to Melvi Broadcasting Network, particularly to join this YouTube channel and all our other platforms and send us your donations. So please click the join button and send us your monthly donations. You can also go to PayPal. If you're out of Africa or wherever, you can send us your PayPal donation. Just go to the details that we're showing you down there and send us your donations on a monthly basis. Obviously, we also have a bank account. I've put the details right there. Send us your donations so that we can do these and many more projects we have of quality media products. We really want to use this platform to prepare you, your family, your friends, and your colleagues to be ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. He is about to come. And this is a small opportunity you and I have to use your blessing to bless us that we may bless others. So God bless you as you consider sponsoring this ministry. Melville Broadcasting Network is a divine voice out of Africa. God bless you.